Hey guys, welcome back. This is gonna be a project video, but it's gonna be a little bit different than we've done in the past. If you watch one of our most recent videos uh, here on the channel, we created a video that is my, my opinion of what uh, tools are essential for the beginner leather craftsman or somebody just wanting to put a box together or a kit together to be able to do general leather work on the road um, in their horse trailer or whatever they're doing. And so that video has been doing really well. Thank y'all to uh, everybody that, that watched that video. Hopefully you got a lot out of it. I thought it would be fun though to kind of continue that video out just a little bit longer and go ahead and build a project only using those tools. It can be real intimidating as you're getting into leather work and you watch a lot of these guys, including myself, on YouTube and we've got some pretty nice machines and different things, different bench top tools that make our job a lot easier and a little bit more efficient. Um, but they are not mandatory and they're not essential to just get started in leather work or even continue with just that set of tools that we talked about in the most recent video. Um, so we thought we'd go ahead and do a project and it's a project that I've been wanting to do for some time and I thought it's a perfect project just to do one where we only use those tools. So everything we do in this video for this project is gonna be sewn by hand, sky by hand, um, all that kind of stuff. We're not gonna use any kind of machines. Um, we'll cut it all out by hand. That way you can kind of see if you're just getting started and you're thinking about buying all these tools just to get yourself a kit together so you can get started, you can see them all being used. We'll also touch on this video on some of the supplies and things like that, but I'll do a separate video where we dive a little bit deeper on different types of supplies that you need, which was outside of that video, such as fasteners, glues, um, dyes, oils, those kind of things. We'll talk about that in another video, but we will be using some of that stuff in here to complete this project. We got a side of 910 ounce Herman Oak uh, skirting leather here. That's what we're gonna use for this project. And the project is gonna be a set of saddlebags. This is a set of saddlebags here, pattern that I came up with a couple of years ago. I think it's a really nice bag. They're not overly large. A lot of times saddlebags can get too big and bulky. Um, and so we made one that's just kind of a really nice functional working set of bags that don't get in the way. They go together fairly simple. There's not a whole lot of com uh, complicated uh, tasks in building this bag. And so I thought it was a perfect project to do with just these tools. So um, you could definitely build this bag out of seven, eight ounce if you want to. You could build it all out of Latigo if you have that. Um, you could probably build this out of chap leather. They're gonna be pretty soft and floppy, but it can be done. Um, so the weight of the leather is just kind of strictly up to you. Um, you could build it out of heavy skirting leather, 12, 14 ounce leather, something like that. But I've built a few pair of these and I think the nine, 10 ounce works just uh, just as good as anything else, and so that's what we're gonna stick with. But let's hop right into the video. We're gonna get started, and we're gonna build these bags. All right, so here's kind of a little shot of our tools. Uh, there was a lot more tools in that video because I had kind of doubles and things like that. Some of the tools aren't up here just yet because we're not ready to use them. I've got them in a drawer over here off to the side, but these are some of the tools that we're gonna use. I'm gonna go ahead and clear this table off so that we can go ahead and roll this side of leather out and cut out our, our saddlebags. Um, here's our pattern. This is the saddlebag body. We do offer a pattern pack for this project video and there'll be a link down in the description for that if you wanna get these patterns. Um, they come with uh, some different tooling patterns and stuff like that in there. But anyway, this is the saddlebag body here. This We'll cut two of these out. This is the saddlebag uh, front panel. This will be the front panel of the bag. We'll cut two of these out. And this is the front flap. So this will be the flap of the bag and we'll cut two of these out. And this is what I call the frog, and it's just a little piece here that'll tie the two bags together so that they're one unit, because we will build a left and a right set, obviously. Um, and so we'll cut all this stuff out. There are gonna be some straps and things too that we'll cut out, and we'll get to those um, here, to here in just a little bit and kind of get those cut out. But I'm gonna clear this table off and get this side rolled out. All right, this is a really nice piece of Herman Oak leather. Like I said, nine, 10 ounce weight. Um, you can cut, honestly, the saddlebags get kind of abused and used. And so you can cut those really anywhere you want as long as the leather is firm. I'm gonna cut these out of the butt. If you've got something that's you know a little more important or something like that, you could always cut these towards the middle and maybe even down towards the belly, but just watch those armpits, watch that belly leather, make sure it's not too stretchy and nasty, but you can get by with that. 
Um, we're also going to cut the gusset out of some shap leather. We'll pull that up when we're ready for that here in just a minute. But for right now, we're going to cut out our pieces. We're going to be cutting those out with the sharp point trim knife, which you guys have seen me use on almost all of my videos. This is what we'll cut our, our pattern out with. And we're going to go through, make sure that it's sharp, make sure that it's ready to go. And so anytime I pick my knife up, usually I will go ahead and just test it. And as long as it cuts fairly smooth, then I know I'm good. If I need to, I can strop it just a little bit and kind of freshen up that blade. All right, so I've got our patterns here. Be sure you're cutting a left and a right. The flap in the front and the front panel don't really matter, but if you'll get in the habit of always flipping your patterns just so that that's a habit for you, um, that'll make things a lot easier so that you don't ever, you don't wanna cut two rights of this, right? This one needs to be flipped over. And so I just get in the habit of always flipping my patterns if I'm cutting stuff out. Always remember too, when you're cutting out this saddlebag, your front flap is going, or your front panel is gonna cover the bottom end of this bag. So like on this side here, I've got some marks up here. Now we would generally try to stay away from those, but we're gonna waste that leather right there. And what else are you gonna cut out of there? Because it's got these marks. You're not gonna be able to cut anything. We're gonna cut a wallet out with those and have those marks in there. So what I would do on a bag, it's a great opportunity since that's not gonna be seen, it's down in the bag. I will go ahead and cut that bag out right there and go ahead and consume that leather and use it. And that way we don't have to waste that. And I'll go ahead and move this over even more as long as we're in a good spot. And then we'll just trace that out with a pencil. Now, like I said, you can use your scratch all to trace these out if you prefer. I prefer using a pencil. And we're gonna make a little light mark there. We're gonna make those hole marks. Be sure you hold your pattern down steady so it doesn't walk around on you. And I have marks on my pattern. There's marks in the pattern pack as well. And I'm gonna put a dot there and there and there. That is gonna be where the flap stitches onto the bag. So we'll stitch that on and then we'll put our front panel and gusset on. And so you wanna go ahead and mark that and we can use our straight edge to line those up here in just a minute. So now I'll flip this. Go left and right. One trick here is we're going to end up with this weird hole that that won't fit in. So what we can do is go ahead and widen that out just a little bit. And that way we can get a flap right there. And we can arc this pattern over some to minimize the amount of waste that we're going to have in the middle. Now that's kind of just a good little trick when you're tracing these things off is to get, try to get everything puzzle pieced together best you can so that you have the least amount of waste. You're going to have waste when you're cutting things out of leather. That's just the way it is. But we wanna minimize that if at all possible. There, and we can get the other flap right here. Now we need our panel. I'm gonna bend that just a little, kind of see where we're at. This is getting just a little soft down here. So I'm gonna move this away right about in here. This right in here is getting a little soft. So we're gonna decide to skip over that for now. Now for me, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this one right beside. The reason I'm doing that is because this is prime area up here and I don't necessarily wanna waste that because that's that'll make this longer. If we come up here, now we've made the less prime area of the hide longer. And so your money in your hides is always your length of the hide that you have left over. So if I need to get some belts out of this piece of leather, this side of leather, this is gonna be less good. It's still good, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's gonna be less good than what this is up here. This back line area right here, this is the back. This is really, really nice leather, and I would rather maintain as much length on this side as possible so that I can still get some really high quality belt blanks out of here, or guitar straps or gun slings, whatever I wanna get out of that. 
I'm gonna preserve that area in that length of that back versus if we cut up here, we've killed the length of the back by this width and now we're forced down into nearing the belly to get those same items. So if you're making something like this, you know, you can kind of just pay attention to that kind of stuff when you're cutting out to maintain your yield. But always remember your money in a side of leather is in its length. That is worth more than anything else in it, especially the length through the back. So we want to try to maintain that as much as possible. And now we just need one little frog and I think we can grab that here in this area where when we got down into here, it gets a little softer. It's not a deal killer, but I'm gonna go ahead and just cut our frog out right here. And I'm also going to make a center line while we have it on the pattern. Right there and right there. It's just gonna tell us kind of how to line that up. Okay. So now we can ben, begin cutting all these out. I'm gonna start through here. They've got a, a cut right there on, on the underside, a butcher cut, and I've got all the flank right here. So I can come in this way to my, my pattern, come around, block this chunk in, and we're gonna maintain the, the better part of this hide. Instead of coming in here, again, we're gonna kill this or come in here. Um, not quite as accurate cutting away from me, so I'd rather pull to me and then come this way. Um, and the, like I said, this knife is sharp. It's, it's, um, it works really, really well, but always remember anything you're cutting, any knives you're using, they're made to cut skin and they don't care if it's yours. So always keep your hand behind the knife in the direction that it's going. Reposition if you don't feel comfortable. When you're cutting something out, don't put yourself in a position to where if that knife slips, you're gonna cut yourself. Cutting out your projects is really a personal task that you have to be comfortable with. So whatever you're, if you're not comfortable cutting the way I'm cutting, then you can certainly cut whatever way you feel comfortable. If you feel more comfortable with a razor knife of some sort, this is gonna be a little heavy leather to cut with the X-Acto blade. So I would not try to cut the bulk of these out with this. You can do some minor trimming and things. But remember again, like we talked about in that video, these little razor blades, they do bend, which makes them handy on thinner leathers, but they will break. And when they break, that's when they're dangerous. So I usually don't cut anything out 910 with that, unless I'm being very, very careful. I would much rather cut it out with this bigger knife that is made for that type of weight. So now we've got that blocked out. So now the bulk of that is there. We can roll up this hide and set it off to the side. Now we can finish cutting out all these pieces. Okay, so we've got our two bodies, our two flaps, and our two front panels, and our frog. Now I'm gonna go ahead and lightly sand these. I will usually do this on a big sander, but since we're doing this video here where we're just gonna be using our hand tools, I'm gonna show you why I do that. When you're cutting things out by hand, when you're cutting things out with a clicker die, if you buy material packs from us, they're clicked out, they're perfect. Um, perfect as I drew them in digital digital format there, but um, but they're gonna cut out the same way every time and they're clean. It takes away the use of all the sanding or the need for all the sanding. Um, cutting things out by hand, if the better you get, the more precise you get, the less sanding you need to worry about. Um, but if you're just starting out, you may have a little wobble in your cut. It may not be perfect. Don't throw it away and do it again. 
unless it's really bad, but if it's just a little wobble here and there, a little thing that maybe could be shaped up, that's what the sanding blocks are for. So we can come in here and we'll just lightly sand, take our round sander here that can get inside those curves, and we're just gonna touch it just a little bit, touch up. That's all we're doing. We're not trying to get a perfect deal here. We're just trying to touch this area up, all of our cuts, so that everything is clean and true. You don't have to spend a ton of time. Like I said, you might have spent longer than I'm doing here, depending on how well you cut it out. But the better you cut, the better you learn to cut things out, the less sanding you will have to do. So all I'm doing is just floating all this together and just making these edges nice. Just so that they're true. This is important because when you're making some things, you're gonna put, like this, the flap, we're gonna put a set of wing dividers on there to mark our our stitch down, stitch down area, the area we're gonna stitch down. Well, if you're running a set of calipers or a set of wing dividers and you've got a bobble in your deal, you're gonna have a bobble in your line. So it um, wouldn't be that crucial there, but if you're doing borders, tooling borders and things, you want a nice crisp edge. All right, so we've gotten all our pieces touched up. One other tool that I might've forgot on the essential tool list, but is a broom, a little, little uh, bench broom or bench sweeper. <laughs> you're gonna need something like that because you get leather dust everywhere, especially when you're sanding. On those bigger finishers, like I have a cabinet finisher you see me use in a lot of my videos. Um, those are really nice because they do have a dust collection system on them. But again, not mandatory. Those things are kind of easy to find sometimes. You can find some type of little sander. You can even use a bench top sander from like Lowe's or something like that. But a sanding block, you know, a flat one and a round one, like we talked about in the video, those are gonna be the two tools you need that'll take care of all your sanding. Now we sanded, we did not try to sand to perfection for doing our edges. All we're doing is sanding for, um, well, we got pretty close on our edge for, for edge work and stuff, but mainly what we're trying to do is shape up our, our lines and make sure that our cuts were good. So we've got all our panels here. We've got everything ready to go. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna grab some chap leather and we're gonna cut out our gussets and then we'll cut out our little straps as well that we're gonna use for our buckles. Okay, so we're gonna cut our little uh, straps. I'm gonna cut a three quarter inch piece of leather. Uh, this is just a nice piece of latigo here. And that's what I'm gonna cut our straps out of to keep it simple. You could definitely cut these straps out of veg tan leather if you'd like. This is a back line that I've used off of a piece of nine, 10 ounce um, latigo to cut some tie straps out of and things, uh, maybe heavier than that. But anyway, I'm gonna take and set our draw gauge. This is a small draw gauge. You're gonna need to probably find one of these at some point so that you can cut strips and uh, your lacing and things like that. Um, so that's something that I did not put in the essential toolbox, but it is something you'll need to add fairly quickly. They sell a different, a bunch of different styles of these. They do not come with this little piece. I added that, um, but you can sometimes still find them. It's just a little wood deal. It does take the same razor blades that our safety skiver and our X-Acto knife take, so that makes it handy. They do make a bigger version for cutting your belt strips, things like that. They use a little heavier razor blade in there for cutting your belt strips and um, things out of nine, 10 ounce leather and heavier, and that's what you're gonna wanna, wanna get for that kind of stuff. For this here, this is fairly soft and uh, we just need a little three quarter inch strip, so we're gonna use this draw gauge. But a draw gauge is something that you'll wanna look into. Um, adding for sure. And so we'll just get that started. And again, I'm cutting this three quarters of an inch. And I'm just gonna cut, as I always do when I'm cutting strips, is I just cut the entire length of whatever I'm cutting it off of. And we can trim it to whatever we need. We'll put this down here, and then we'll take this, and that's a good little strap there. So we will set that aside, and we'll figure out our length on that stuff here in just a few minutes, whenever we get ready to do the straps. And so now we'll cut our gusset, 
and I've got this leather here that was the same stuff we used on the simple briefcase, I believe. It's just a piece of that distressed leather uh, that's left. We've got a portion here that's already straight edged. We need to make sure that it's long enough. In the pattern pack, I say to cut this 22 and a half inches long for the gusset. And the gusset, the gusset's the piece that's gonna go around the front panel and then attach to the body. That's gonna make your pocket, obviously. Um, and the quickest way to find that, if you don't have a measurement for something you're making and you wanna make a gusset, is set it on your piece and roll it, and that'll tell you how long to cut it. But what you're gonna to wanna to do is do it the way we do it in the video, which I've already done this part, and I oversize cut. So the pattern says 22 and a half, roughly. That's giving you more than enough because as you've seen us do before, and as you'll see us do here in just a minute, we're gonna glue this up. We're gonna get it flush right here, glue it in, and then whatever's overhanging in excess, we'll mark and cut that off. That'll give us our true measurement for both of them. We can cut them to actual measurement. So always fit your gussets before you, um, or when you cut them out, always oversize them and then fit them to the project. So I'm gonna cut this roughly 22 and a half. And I will take our square. And I will try my best to keep that square along our cut mark. And we're gonna come inside. And I wanna put a mark at three inch and six inch. Cause we're gonna make these gussets three inches wide. I feel like that's a good size for these bags. And we need two of them. So we'll put marks there at three and six. And then we can take a longer straight edge or you can use a small, your smaller one, whatever you'd like to do. And now we've got our two. So now I'm gonna take a pair of shears. This is a surefire way of cutting with a little more control. You could definitely use your blade for this, but I find the shears work just as good. On this softer type chap leather here. And then we can straight edge, straighten up those ends if we want to, just don't cut too much off. Like I said, these are oversized, so we should have plenty. So we will set those aside. We've got both our gussets. We'll roll this shaft leather back up. And we'll just set this down here for now. All right. So we've got our strapping material for our little straps and buckles, our gussets, and all of our pieces. Our two front panels, our two flaps, our two bodies, and our frog. And that should be everything minus a little bit of lace, which we'll cut whenever we get ready for that. So what we're gonna do first is, we're going to mark off our straight edge, those dots that we put inside the, the bag. We put, whenever we trace the pattern off, we had those dots right there. That's gonna be where your flaps go into glue down to and stitch down. So we'll take here and just put us a nice little light line. Don't have to get crazy, just something that you can see. And then we'll put one down here. Okay, do the same on this side. So we've got those. Now what I wanna do is I wanna line up my frog here. And my pattern, I have a if you buy the pattern pack, and real quick, we can see when we put this together that we need to do a little trimming. We want this flush on the back side, but as you can see, I've got a little overhang on this, so I'm gonna trim that off. Just so that matches. There, that's better. Um, but on the pattern pack, if you get that, I have a mark on here where this is gonna lie. 
in reference to the to the frog. But on here, I don't have it yet because I haven't printed the pattern pack. And so what I'll do, actually we have the pattern. I'm sorry. We do have the pattern. And so what I'll do is then we'll put this on here, center line. You can just fold it in half, line that up with your top edge of your bag. And if you gotta push it forward just a little bit, we can always trim a little extra off there if we need to. And we'll just put us a light line. Do the same on this side. And don't make these lines super heavy. You just wanna be able to see them. They're just for reference. So we just wanna be able to line these pieces up when we go to glue these bags together. So that's good. Let's see, that's, that's good there. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and get some slicking done. So we've got our little can of water. We've got our slicking rag. We've got a little piece of saddle soap. You can usually buy this at any uh, feed store or anything like that. You can usually find some saddle soap, just a glycerin bar. Um, and it'll come in, it'll come in a box like this. And it's just a big uh, bar of soap, basically. Glycerin saddle soap by Five Bings. Uh, we do offer this on the website. I think we're currently out right now, but we do try to carry that. But you can usually pick it up at any feed store or co-op. So if when you're out and about and you're looking there, just grab one or two of those. And I just cut a chunk off and that's what we use. And then we're gonna take our edgers. I remember I suggested a number two and a number four. I'm gonna go ahead and use a number four on this, um, on, on this project here, because we're at nine, 10 ounce leather, that's gonna make a nice edge. And so we'll do that. So we're gonna edge everything that we need to. On the flap, you do not need to edge this back part. All we're gonna edge is around the front of the flap. So just that from, from here, all the way around to the other side. And so we'll just work that edger around there. Try to keep it cutting evenly takes a little practice. Um, if you're not comfortable with an edger, practice on some scraps before you start practicing on stuff that you cut out, just till you kind of get a feel of where the cutting surface is and how to hold the tool in position for it to do its job. Okay, so those are our two flaps. And then our front panels, yeah, we'll go ahead and just edge the top and we'll edge around here after we get the uh, gusset in there and stuff like that. We'll do those later. So we're just gonna go ahead and edge the top of the front panels, both sides. So then our frog, we're gonna go ahead and edge. Don't edge the back side just yet, just edge around here to the front. And I'm gonna edge the bottom with a number two, just because this is going to sit flat on the actual saddlebag uh, body. And so I don't wanna edge quite as much. It's just a personal preference. If you wanna edge the whole thing with a number four, that's fine. But when something's going to set flat on something else, I want it to kind of join up flush and I don't really want it to duck under because it's sitting on top of this. It's just my personal preference um, of the way things look. But um, sometimes I won't edge that at all, but I found if I just take a real small one and just knock that corner off, when I slick this, that'll still make it look nice and even there. It's a small little thing that doesn't really matter, but just kind of putting that out there. So on now we're gonna edge our body here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna edge from here all the way down to where we get to those lines that we made, and we're gonna stop just past that and just come off of there. So we'll come here and just stop right there. And then on the other side, we'll start just past that first line and then go out and stop just short of where that frog is gonna set. The reason is, is because when we sew this frog on at the end when the bags are done, I wanna be able to sand this real good and get a nice smooth edge right there. And I wanna slick all that one time. So these two layers, the frog and the two saddle uh, bag bodies, I wanna be able to slick that edge and that's gonna make that really nice and professional looking. And so we don't want an edged area right there cause it's gonna make it harder to sand that flush. So I wanna leave that hole. So stop just past where that frog is gonna set on there. 
Then we'll do the back side. Gonna have to look kind of where you were and just go from there. Okay, so we've got those edged. So now what we'll do is go ahead and start slicking our edges. I have a video showing you the full process of how to slick edges, as well as an article um, on that. And so you can watch that. But basically what we're gonna do is put water on there with our dauber, just a little bit of water, that's all that's in that can. And then we're going to take our glycerin soap and just lightly rub that edge with that soap. The rule of thumb that we used to always use in the shop was more water, less soap. So don't put a ton of this on there because you'll start smearing it all over the leather and it will stain a little bit and it'll be hard for the oil to penetrate that glycerin soap and you may get some discoloration when you go to oil it. It doesn't hurt the leather, it's just gonna make it unsightly where you're trying to oil and get an even coat. So I try to use very little soap, it's just a little bit just to kind of help the speed of the of the slicking process where it doesn't take quite as long and it gives it a good sealed edge. And the purpose of, of slicking the edges is one, because it looks really nice, um, but two, it, it also seals that cut edge so that the water or moisture over time doesn't penetrate into the leather quite as quickly because now instead of this being a raw edge, it is kind of finished edge that is shut off and, uh, and slicked down. So you're not losing oils and moisture out of your leather through that cut edge. And here it's not really speed of your movement, it's really the pressure. So what you're, you're putting the pressure on there, you're trying to burnish that edge, which is causing heat and friction, which is going to seal those fibers. And so using that, not so much speed is what's gonna get that done. And so now that piece has been slicked. And so now we'll go through all these other pieces and do everywhere that we edged. So wherever we hit it with the edger, that's where we're gonna slick. Okay, so now we're gonna wait for these edges to dry and that way we, um, we can put some dye on those and we'll kind of go over a little bit of that in these. You don't have to dye your edges. I think it looks a lot nicer if you do, but it's not mandatory at all. I've seen some really, really refined, super nice work where they don't dye the any edges at all. And that's a completely um, acceptable to do that. But if you do want to dye your edges, I figured go ahead and show y'all in this video what I do there. Um, it's not very hard, it's not very uh, complicated, but while these, if you're gonna dye them, they need to dry completely. If you're not dy dyeing your edges, you can continue on with your construction, um, but if you are gonna dye them, they need to dry really well. So we'll put these in front of a fan, get them to dry out for us off camera, and then we'll be ready to come back and do that. But before we do that, we might as well go ahead and do all our punching, and we're gonna punch some holes. Now, the first few are gonna be really easy. Um, if you notice in the pattern, I've got a couple holes here. That's gonna be for some lace. And then I've got one big hole here. Um, in the tool list that I did, the tool video that we just did, I only have a number two, a number four, a number eight, and a number 10 hole is what I suggest that you keep in your kit. So we're gonna keep to that, to the, what we talked about in doing, in, in making this video, we're only gonna use those tools. I would prefer this hole to be bigger than that. Maybe a number 12 um, or 13, 14, whatever, something like that. Basically what this hole right here is for is when they are on the saddle, uh, a lot of saddles will have a set of saddle strings right there at the bottom of the seat panel. And you can take the um, one end of the saddle string, come up through that hole and half hitch or however you wanna tie that in. And that just keeps this front end of the bags up against the back of the seat. Um, but if you don't wanna do that or you wanna do a buckle there, you wanna do something completely different, um, or maybe it's not going on a saddle with strings right there, then you can just leave that hole off um, if you prefer. These bottom two, I think are very important. These are we're gonna use a number eight hole for these. This is gonna be, we're gonna put a piece of lace in and that little piece of lace, maybe yay long, that's gonna be for tying it to the rigging D or the flank D of the saddle. That's gonna keep the bottom of the bags from flopping up and down as they're being used or uh, somebody's riding around. The bags aren't just flopping all over the place. That'll keep them down and, and secure so they're not flipping up and down. Um, so we'll go ahead and punch those. We're gonna use our number eight drive punch and we're gonna punch right here and set it on our mark 
and go through. Now, this is a cutting board material here on the workbench on the top. I do use my punches on that. You just need to be careful not to go too far um, as far as really whooping on one. If, you've really, if I've really got like a bigger tool, like our two inch bag slot or something, and I'm really gonna, uh, gonna put a lot of force on it, I'm gonna go to my clicker and use my chopping block on that. But for just little holes and things, we can definitely do that on this bench. I would not do it on plywood. Um, you could use just regular pine wood or something like that as a chopping block, it's fine. But I would not use regular plywood. It tends to uh, damage your tools a little more. But also, we can use our mat that we talked about in that video. You can always use a nice, dense rubber mat, Poundo board. Uh, Weaver sells something called Poundo board. It's basically the same stuff right here. You could definitely use that um, if you want to be um, really careful with your tools. I don't find that this does anything to my tools over time, but again, I'm not doing a ton of punching there. But I'm gonna go ahead and use a number 10 here. It's going to be a little snug for a set of saddle strings, but what we can do is we can round that out a little bit with our awl, like we talked about, and kind of do that. Kind of come in from this backside and just tease that out just a little bit, just round that out just so that maybe that string will slide through there. Um, you could also add a grommet right here if you wanted to do a grommet, that would be really nice. A nice big grommet right there would work out really nice too. But we're just gonna punch that hole there. And so those are the two that we need on that one. And so we'll get these two done. So we've got our holes in our body now. They're ready to go. The only other holes that we really need to make right now is gonna be this bag slot. And on the pattern pack, you'll see there's gonna be, we need a bag punch right there because that's where our strap's gonna go for our buckle. And so we've got to mount that in there. And so how do we do that? We don't have on that toolkit, I didn't put any type of bag slots or uh, slot punches or anything like that in there. Mainly just because to keep the cost down and it's not a mandatory thing. You can do leather work without them. It does make it a lot nicer. So if you're doing leather work, I would, I would highly suggest getting some oblong punches or some what they call bag slots. And that's going to make your different sizes there. If you're curious, I keep a, a half inch bag slot, a three quarter inch, a one inch, and then my big two inch, but they have them in all sizes. But those tools are expensive individually, so you might collect those as you can and kind of add those and get the ones that you use the most. But to do a simple bag slot without one, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna punch a hole on one end with a number four. I'm gonna use my number four punch. And then we're gonna come on this side and make another hole. And so we've got two holes there. And now we're gonna take our knife and we're gonna very carefully begin to cut between them. Now this is done best with a super sharp knife. You can also use a chisel. If you have a nice sharp chisel, that works very well for this. But again, I didn't put that in our toolkit. So we're only using those tools. So we're gonna use this. And you can pick the push your knife down into your pondo board or your rubber mat and then pull that leather up. Just go very slow. And if I'm doing it like this, I prefer to come from one side then to the other and take my time because you don't want to overcut into your into your um, holes that you've made. And then you can come in here and we can kind of clean that up a little bit. As long as your knife is sharp, you shouldn't have any trouble. And there's a bag slot there. Like I said, the bag punches are very worth, very much worth their money, but they are something else to buy. So if you don't, I'd rather you have a good knife than spend your money on a really good knife than spend your money on a bag slot. If, if you could only get one or the other. And so now, if you have a good set of round edgers, you can take these Ron's edgers and you can kind of just bar barely edge the top and the bottom of that slot, and that'll clean that up some. You can also do the same on the inside. That really helps too with that strap going through there. These are hard to do with the common Western edger. Um, 
the other edger that we showed in that video, it's a little harder to get that edger down in there, even in a number two. So the round edgers, they work really well for that, but it's not necessary. It just cleans it up just a little bit. So now we'll do this side. And so now we need to add a hole. I don't, I didn't have it on my pattern, but it is on the pattern pack. We need a hole for a copper rivet, number four copper rivet. Again, we're gonna use the number four. Center that up from the bag slot. And I usually go, let's see, I'd usually just eyeball it, but let's say a quarter inch or so from the edge, maybe almost three eighths, something like that. Centered up on the bag slot. And that'll be where our where our rivet goes to hold that strap in. Okay. So we've got our holes there. So that's all we need those for. Now I'm gonna get another work surface that I didn't mention in the other video, which is just a piece of granite. This I left it out of the video because this is more for tooling, but it's also for construction. Um, it's not something you're going to fit in a toolbox. It's not something you're going to carry around with you generally, unless you're going to a class. But having a good piece of granite countertop or something like this, sink cutouts you can get from uh, your granite countertop companies. They cut out a sink hole. You can usually buy those sink cutouts for 20 bucks. A lot of times they'll just give them to you. But you're going to want something like that. Um, I've seen a lot of guys use a piece of uh, safety glass, like windshield material, uh, safety glass stuff um, for skiving. But I prefer just using a piece of granite for skiving as long as it's smooth, it's not jagged or anything, and most of the time they are. Um, but we'll use that for skiving. And what we wanna do on these flaps while these edges, edges are drying, so we're gonna take our safety skiver and we're gonna skive the top edge of this because this top edge is gonna come right there and get glued down and we're gonna sew it in place and that'll be our flap for our saddlebag well i don't want this big lip right here we want a nice transition right there into the bag and so we're going to sky that down and you're basically going to sky down this is three quarters of an inch width here so if you wanted to take your wing dividers just so you have an idea of where you are um, you sure can you set three quarters of an inch from the end and then take your wing dividers here set those and make you a mark just as a guide for where you're skiving. Um, it's completely up to you. You can also just eyeball it. We basically don't want this whole three quarters of an inch width down to nothing. We want a long taper down to nothing out here, but it needs to start thickening back up as it gets here because that's where it's gonna get a lot of wear because that's the flap. And so we just want this edge gone mainly and a nice even transition back into full thickness. I suggest anytime you're doing some skiving, a lot of this leather sometimes, especially Hermit Oak, will sky fine without any water, but it makes it a lot easier to control how much you're taking off and get a nice good job done if you'll mist it with a little bit of water. So I always suggest keeping a little water bottle um, around and that um, as a part of the supplies, and that way you can mist this down. You could also use a sponge and just put water on there, but I, I feel like misting is just a little faster. And it doesn't take much. You just need a little bit of moisture on there, and we're just gonna get it mainly where we're skiving. We don't have to do the whole thing. And then we're just gonna take our skiver with a nice blade in there. Again, it takes the same blades that we use in our X-Acto knife. Um, and we're just gonna begin skiving this bottom edge here. Be sure your hand is away from the skive blade and that your hand is pushing down to keep the work from moving on you. You don't want everything moving around. Hold it nice and steady, keep your fingers out of the way, let it do the cutting and just pull it along your edge. So as you can see there, maybe from a side profile, it's still fairly full thickness back here at our three quarter inch mark, but it tapers down to very thin right there. And that's what we want. Um, I have one trick when you're skiving, especially down to a feathered edge, is to try not to come this way 
because that blade will cut into, the thinner that gets, the more apt you are to cut into it. We wanna come off of the material. So we're gonna skive off of the material to get that feathered edge. And that's just gonna take off. And then you can lightly kind of scratch the rest of that off of there. But you're gonna to wanna to be coming off of the material, not into the material, because you will end up cutting your piece and have to cut another one. So now we'll do this other one here. All right, so we've got those done and those edges are drying. So we'll let those kind of hang out for just a minute. Okay, so while we're waiting on these edges, they're almost ready to go. But what I wanna do first is we're gonna go ahead and groove this. Um, like I said, in a lot of my videos is, and we did in the last one, as far as the tools go, you don't necessarily have to groove your stitch lines, but we're going to because I just like it. And I think it looks nice. And so we're gonna groove these and your, your stitch length, uh, stitch relief. We've got a video talking about that on how you determine how far in to stitch. But usually on most thicknesses, um, if you're going, if you're gonna stitch something, um, I usually will do somewhere around 3 16 of an inch from the inside. Um, that's usually a good rule of thumb. If you're doing thicker pieces or thicker work, you're gonna wanna come in a little bit further when you do that stitch, uh, stitch relief. If you're doing real, real thin stuff, you can get, kinda get closer to that edge a little bit uh, a little bit more. But the main thing is you wanna be inside far enough to where when you come in with your edger, you've got room to take off material based on the thickness of your work without getting into your stitches. So that's kind of what, what all that's about. And so I'm gonna go ahead and sit this groover and these groovers are fairly easy to use. You just allow this piece here in this groover to ride along the outside edge of your work, hold it at the proper angle so that the blade can do its cutting. And we're gonna go all the way around this front panel here and that way it's ready to go. And so now we've imparted a groove there and our stitches will sit down in that groove. And that's pretty much all we're gonna have to groove except for, oh, we gotta groove our frog. Um, I'm gonna wait to do that for when we get ready to attach it because this does overhang the end of our actual bag body here. And so I don't wanna groove past that because we'll just sew to the where the bag body start, stops and then across and then over and that's gonna join the two bags together. So we'll wait on that one. But now we're ready, we can go ahead and dye these edges. Um, before we do that though, let's go ahead and fit our gusset so that we can do that. What I'm gonna do is the way I do my gussets, like I said, this is oversized cut. This is longer than we need. That's the way you usually want them. That way you can trim them to fit your project. And this stuff, depending on what you decide to use for your gusset, yours might stretch more than mine when you're pulling it in. And so you wanna be sure that you custom fit that for the project you're doing. Don't just blindly trust my measurements on gussets anytime we do gussets. This falls under the category of supplies, but it's glue. Now what we're gonna use is just a regular contact cement. You can use the glue of your choice. Um, I don't find rubber cement is good for this type of work myself. Um, I prefer a contact cement. It's gonna give you a, a much better um, a bonding um, with this stuff. It does stink, and so if you're if you're a young person or you're working with young people doing uh, projects like this and you prefer not to have the, the strong odor of contact cement, then your um, Maker's Leather Supply does sell a version of a, I think it's a water-based contact cement and it works really well. I have the kids, my kids using that in the shop and um, I feel much better than using that. I've been smelling this glue for 20 years and it's probably not the best for my health, um, but I, and I still use it in the shop and they're in here in the shop and that kind of thing. But when they're working on projects, I would prefer them to use something not as um, aggressive on its, on its smell and fumes. And so Maker's Leather Supply does sell a, just a water-based contact cement. And it actually works really good. It works really well. Um, I was surprised. I did, I'm nothing against Aaron or anybody over there, but I'm just, I'm a contact cement guy and I just had a hard time believing that stuff was gonna work really well, but the kids love it, they use it. It bonds really well, so that is a good option. So we're gonna put just a little strip of glue on either side you want on the gusset. Put that over there, let that dry. Remember all your contact cements, when you're using a contact cement type adhesive, it has to get tacky before it's sticky. So you can't just put it on and stick it somewhere. 
um, and expect it to hold. It's got to air dry a little bit, and um, and that's exactly what even that water-based glue is the same way. And so now we're just going to go around our front panel, and we're going to put a little glue on here. And you might be thinking, Don, what about your edges? You're going to glue your edges. We're not we're not final fitting this gusset. Um, we're, this isn't permanent. We're going to put it on and then find out how long we need it, and we're going to take it right back off. And um, and so we're just going to do one of these. You don't have to do both of these right now. We're just trying to get a size. And then, we, then we'll dye our edges. We won't forget about that. So we'll let both of those air dry. It might take five, 10 minutes. Wait until they're tacky. It should, be, it should stick to your finger without getting glue on you. And then it's ready to glue up. So we'll give that some time. Okay, so our glue has gotten nice and tacky. I'll be honest, I actually put two coats on here. Sometimes you need to do two. Um, especially on chap leather like this, sometimes it'll just absorb in and it's not very tacky. So if it's not very tacky to you, um, then go ahead and just put you a second coat on there. That's usually more than enough. Um, but now we'll go ahead and take this gusset here. And the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is on one end, you wanna check, make sure that you're square. Um, you'll usually forget which side you, we used a square when we cut it out, but sometimes you'll forget. Just check, make sure that you're starting with the square side. We want to go ahead and make sure that that's nice and square, which it is. So now we'll just start and, and on this side here, we're glue, glue to glue and just flush it up to the top edge of your piece. It's a little down, get up here where I can see a little bit and we'll go ahead and flush that up. And then you want to come around and just keep it flush with your outer edge. Turn, turn it up and kind of make it like a taco almost whenever you go around here that'll help you to get your edges down going around a curve and push it down as you go try not to pull or stretch the gusset if your material is real stretchy you can kind of throw off your measurement by pulling it too much you want to kind of keep it just kind of setting it down and make a nice even movement around that corner these bags don't have any real sharp corners, so it makes it a lot easier to put a gusset on. That's why I designed them that way. Um, and, that, and that way you can put a gusset in fairly simply with these. If you've got a square corner, it makes it much more difficult. Okay, so now that gusset is glued in. You can see we're nice and flush around the edge here. Um, if you're, if you're, when you put this in for the final time, sometimes you want to err on coming out just a little bit, just so that as you're sewing this, you can see that. I talk about that in some videos. If you're sewing on a machine, you want to be sure you can see a little piece of that gusset as you're running down with the machine, so that you know you're not missing it because you can't see underneath. We're going to hand sew this, so we're going to be pretty. It's going to be pretty advantageous for us hand sewing it because we're going to be able to make sure that gusset is exactly where we want it to be. So it's not quite as quite as crucial, but like I said, I like to let it be flush to overhang just a tick, and that way I can always see that material underneath there. So now, as you can see, we've got this much excess. Obviously, we're going to cut that off, and the way I'm going to do that is we're just going to come in here with our pencil, and we're going to mark the very top edge of our front panel where that top edge is, we'll put a mark on the gusset. And so now, we can take this gusset completely off. It should release really easily. And then we'll take our square again. We're gonna, remember this is leather, so it's not a board, so you're gonna have to make sure that it's, it's staying squared up on your material. Move your material so that it rides along this edge here so we get a nice square cut. We'll put a mark across there. And then we would take our leather shears and just trim off that excess. Now this gusset is custom fit for that panel perfectly. So now we don't have to worry about it. We can put it on as long as we're not pulling and stretching too much. It should go on and they should meet up at the top perfectly. We can start at one side and go all the way around. It should end up right. Um, 
If you are in doubt that your panels are not the same size, which they should be, because you use the same pattern, you cut them out by hand, should be perfectly the same size. But if you are worried, you can, you can, you can fit the next one to fit this panel. I would just trust that they're the same. And now we can go ahead and just take this panel here. I mean, this gusset, and we can go ahead, butt up to our square end where that's going to be. Make sure it's down. We're not pulling it or stretching it. And now we will mark this side over here. And we will just cut the second gusset to where it is the exact same length as the first. And now that is our both of our gussets. Now they're cut to fit, we're ready to go on those. Now we'll dye edges on all our little pieces here. And then we'll let those edges dry and we'll be ready to start putting some stuff together. Now for dyeing edges, I prefer to use these. If you're just starting out, it gives you a lot of control. My kids use these quite a bit here in the shop. Um, occasionally they'll get old and they will leak when you turn them this way to use them. So be careful with that. Make sure you're not dyeing this edge over some other work. Dye it off the table or off to the side. And that way, if it does happen to leak, um, these I got from Maker's Leather Supply and they do not leak so far. Um, I haven't had any wear out. I had some other ones that uh, I think came from Amazon or something. It's probably something I did, but anyway, it, it leaked real bad. So I went ahead and threw it away, but they work great. You just unscrew the top, put your dye in there. I'm just using Five Beings Pro Oil Dye. I think now they just call it Pro Dye. That's all I'm using. Um, you can use whatever edge dressing you're, you want to use. I think dye works the best, so that's what I use. Um, our edges are dry, so we'll take that off. This is a dark brown. You can use any color you want to use. Um, I prefer browns. I think they look nice, brown, mahogany, something like that. It's got a felt tip. First time you use it for a while. If you haven't used it in a while, you just want to give it one little bump on a piece of scrap leather, and that's going to load that with, with more dye. And then you're just going to want to run along the edge be very careful to only get where your edger got. So you don't want it to, and you don't push this, this end in when you don't push it against the leather. You just let it touch the leather like a paintbrush and it'll transfer the amount of dye you need. If it starts running low in that felt tip, you can always bump it again on that, on that leather once or twice and it'll release more dye. And so there's our little dyed edge, and we're only dying where we slicked. Okay, so we've given our edges just a few minutes to dry here. The, you'll find that the brown dyes or any kind of earth tone dyed brown color, that kind of thing, will usually dry fairly quickly, like real quick. Um, so you don't have to wait, you know, overnight or anything like that. Black dye is a different story. Sometimes black dye seems to never dry, but um, but that you might want to be a little bit more careful of. You can always take an old rag that maybe has a little bit of oil in it from you drying your hands off at the oiling station or something and just rub that edge with a rag, a shop rag or something. Just make sure it's not, it can be dirty like this one, but it needs to be leather dirty, not mechanic shop dirty, right? Um, and then you can just kind of buff those edges just a little bit. You'll notice them shine a little bit more, which is nice, that's what we're after. But mainly you're getting any residue off from the from the dye. Like I said, browns, usually not a problem. Black, you might do this and notice a black streak on the, on the rag. And so that's something you gotta be careful with because you'll get it all over all the other parts of your project. Um, but anyway, we're gonna take this, we're gonna take our original gusset, we're gonna glue these gussets in, and then we're gonna sew them in onto the front panels. That's where they go on first. And then, um, and then we'll be ready to work on the bodies and get those flaps sewn on. But before we do that, we're gonna go ahead and mark our stitch holes because it's gonna be much easier to do right now before this gusset is on while this can lay flat. So we're gonna take our overstitch wheel. This overstitch wheel is a number five, so that's five stitches per inch. Um, you can use, if you don't have an overstitch wheel, we put some links in an article from the earlier video showing where you could get those. These, apparently, they don't make anymore. I wasn't able to find this one. Um, I didn't hunt around on Amazon too much just because I don't know where some of that stuff's coming from, and I hate to give you all a source that maybe you never get it or uh, maybe it takes two months to get because it's coming from overseas or something. So um, I put the one in there from Tandy that it looks like that they're the only one they're offering, which has chain, uh, exchangeable wheels in there for all the different stitch links. 
I'm assuming it's okay. Um, it, it's probably no no worse than this one. Um, so whatever works best for you. If you do have pricking irons, you can mark your holes with that. You can do whatever, but we're going to stitch this with an all and two needles. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna start right here at the edge and we're just gonna roll this wheel and do our best to stay in our groove. All this is doing is making little dots where all of our holes are gonna be. That's your whole spacing. So that's gonna give us five stitches per inch. And just take your time. You don't have to press super, super hard. You just need to make a mark enough for you to see when you're on the stitching horse. Try not to come out of your groove. And so there's all our holes marked. And so we'll do that to the other one, but we'll go ahead and get this gusset glued in. I'm gonna reapply glue here on the gusset, let that set. This already has two coats on it. Even though we pulled it off, it's still a little tacky. One extra coat on here ought to be enough. We'll glue this gusset in, and then we'll do the other one the same. They'll be ready to sew. Real quick, you saw some glue drip right there onto my rock. That's why I, I prefer to have a stone on my bench at some point. Um, it's not mandatory, but it sure is easier to clean off any kind of glue or anything. If you happen to get glue dropped on a piece of veg tan or any leather really, and it drips like it did here and it gets on something, don't rub it off. Just l move it over, let that glue dry completely, and then it should just peel right off. It may leave a slight little stain on there, um, but if it's just a little bit of glue, usually you can oil that out. Um, but the worst thing you can do when you get glue dropped on something is to rub it off. Because when it's wet and you rub it off, you're forcing that glue in a liquid form down into the grain of the leather. And it's really it makes it more of a mess and it can impart a bigger stain. So that's kind of always my rule of thumb. If you drop any on something, just let it sit there and let it dry. And then you can come in with a piece of gum rubber or, um, or creep. Crepe sole, a little scrap piece of crepe sole will work. Um, sometimes a pencil eraser, just be careful because it can stain the leather. But a lot of times you just grab it with your fingernails and it'll peel right off. And hopefully it doesn't leave a big stain. But the ultimate goal is not to get glue all over your stuff. So we'll set that aside and we'll glue these other ones up and then we'll be ready to put these gussets in. Okay, so our first one, I just put a second coat on the other front panel, and so this one's ready to glue up. So we're gonna do it the same way we did it a minute ago when we tried to get it all sized up. So we're just gonna take our glue side. The glue is nice and tacky. We'll start at the top, keep it flush. Push it down as you walk along. Keep it right along the edge there. Turn it up and just let that corner walk around. A little bit at a time in your corners. Don't get too far ahead of yourself or you have to pull it off and fight it to get it around there. And we'll see how good we did here. Perfect. Hit it up right at the top edge. We've got no, none of it hanging over. Everything's where it needs to be. Now you can take our shop hammer something smooth faced. You can get away with a ball peen here if you need to because this is shap leather. Just be careful so you don't scratch the leather. But I want to get a good contact here for that glue so that glue holds that gusset in place so it doesn't come loose while we're trying to get it sewed up. And this is another spot here where a good piece of marble or granite on your bench comes in handy because if you're hammering this, you want something solid just so you get a good compression there. But also you don't want a, a work surface that's marred up from knife work and things like that and you're beating on this thing with the smooth side facing down. You can get some marks and, and uh, what I call shop marks or bench marks all over this thing and then you gotta fight those. And So it just keeps your work clean. This is nice and smooth. So that's glued in, that's ready to go. We'll get the other one glued up and then we'll meet you at the stitching horse and we'll begin to sew this together. All right, so we've already got our gussets glued in to our front panels. They're ready to go. We've got our stitch markers on there uh, with our overstitch wheel so we know what stitch length we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be stitching five stitches per inch. Um, that's not terribly small, but it's not terribly large either. It's gonna look really nice. Um, and then we've got our hand stitching all. I'm gonna be using my Berry King 
hand stitching all here. This is the one that I prefer to use. It's got a diamond tip on it or a diamond blade. Um, and that link on that article, we did talk about all halves. I found both of them, one from Barry as well as one, I think it's Springfield, which was the exact same one of the other one that I always use. Um, as far as blades, they're not super expensive. Buy you a few, pick out which ones you like. I like the ones that Barry sells. Um, I also like some of the Osborne blades, but honestly, a lot of them, you're gonna have to kind of touch up to your liking as you become more and more familiar with hand sewing. Um, and that way you can get them for different applications. You're sewing a wallet versus sewing a holster. You might want a different blade for that. So that's just one of them deals. You're gonna have to kind of figure that out by trial and error. Um, but usually just getting a decent one, maybe like the one that I shared on there, I think that's pretty close to what I've had, um, aside from my sharpening it over the years to kind of modify it or really fine tune it. Um, the thread that I'm using is gonna be a braided thread, hand stitching thread that Aaron at Makers Leather Supply sells. This comes in a lot of different colors. It's similar to Tiger Thread, um, but it's really nice. This is a one, I think one millimeter, one oh, something like that. It's It comes in different sizes. This is kind of, I think, the, uh, the biggest one that they sell because I do a lot. When I'm hand sewing, usually it's on tack or saddles or something like that. And so I don't do a lot of fine um, hand stitching um, anymore. If I gotta do some fine stitching, it's usually done on a machine. But for these saddle bags, this weight's gonna work out fine. I think it's 110, 1.0, 1 something like that. You can talk to the guys at Makers and uh, find out which size they, they would recommend for what you're doing. Um, and then you need a couple harness needles and we'll put those on the thread. Um, like I said, there's a video showing step-by-step yeah, step, all the things as far as hand sewing goes. Um, links down in the description, check that out. As far as guessing how much thread you're gonna need to sew around this panel, we're gonna need to go from here all the way to here. I usually just eyeball it, it may be wasteful. Um, I'm sure guys that hand sew a ton have a, um, a really good rule of thumb on how to figure out that distance. I usually go by pulls. So I'll do one pull, which is my arm stretched out, roughly six feet or so of thread, and then I'll do another one, and then that's usually where I'll start. You can always, if you run out of thread, you can always um, start again, backstitch and end that stitch, and then start with a new piece to finish off what you got. But yes, it is kind of part of the hand sewing game is figuring out exactly how much thread you're gonna need for a project and understanding that. But we'll go ahead and get our needles on here and then we'll get here on the stitching horse and we'll uh, get started sewing these up. All right, so I'm here at my stitching horse. This is one my dad made when I was in college. It's got two big jaws on it. These, There's a lot of variations of these. You've seen some of the antique ones um, that you can get a hold of. This one here, that's not really hard, too hard to build. We may do a video just on this stitching horse, but we talk about it as well in the stitching video. And so you can go back and watch that and, uh, and see more about that. There's also one that Aaron at Makers Leather Supply sells. And it's this one here. Um, I, got, I bought two of these for the kids and they're really nice because they, they can clamp onto a bench right here and you can stand or sit at a bench or a stool and sew smaller items and things like that. These are really handy, um, kind of fun to have around in the shop. Not sure we'll use it on this project, but I have used it a couple of times sewing different things on it and they use it all the time. So those work out really good too. What we'll do is we'll release our jaws here. Now you can either sew your project going to you, like sewing to you, or sewing away from you. It's kind of whatever you prefer, whatever's more comfortable for you. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and start out this way. Since I don't hand stitch as often anymore, um, I just kind of start and if I need to change it around, I'll do it different on the next piece. But right now I'm gonna start right here. I think that's gonna work out best for me. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start our first hole. You wanna go in straight. Be sure that you can see where you're going. You wanna to, want to have that needle or that blade angled so that it's angled across the cut. It's not pointed, you know, the cutting edges aren't pointing to each other. They're kind of at an angle across your gauge or your groove. And that way your stitches won't pull out quite as easy. But we'll start the first hole and we're gonna put our thread in there. And then we're gonna go and keep our needles. We got a needle on each end of our thread, one continuous piece of thread. And then we'll keep those level and pull that work up. And now we can keep the thread on each side. I hold my needles here um, in between my first and second finger there. And then that still allows me to hold my awl. Then we can come in here. You wanna go through straight so that your awl makes a straight cut from front to back so that you're not 
your stitches on the back side look just as good as the front side basically. And then we'll pass the needles through, one from one side to the other, and then we'll pull that thread tight. That's one stitch. And then we'll go to our next hole. You want a hole that's only as big as you need to get that needle and thread to pass through there. You don't want a big honking hole through there. It's gonna look a lot prettier if your hole is as small as it can be, but you also need to be able to get the, the needle, the knot, and the thread to pass through evenly. Now, if you'll notice, when I pass this first needle through, I'm coming all the way, and then I'm pulling both sides of that thread back towards me, because when I pass this next needle in, I don't want it piercing this thread that's in there, because if that happens, you're gonna end up having to take your needle off of your thread, pull that thread back, it's because it's gonna pierce this one, so when you pull both of them, you're gonna have a knot, and it's, it's not gonna be able to complete the stitch. And so that's why I do that. Um, it's just kind of a way I've learned to kind of help prevent that. It still can happen. Um, and if it does, you're just gonna have to kind of work on your technique and practice so that you don't have that happen too often. Cause it is kind of annoying when you've got to take your, your needle off the thread and pull it out and re-thread it and do all that. But as you see the way I'm sewing, I'm never putting down my awl. So I'm not having to put a tool down and pick it up. I know where my needles are. It's To me, this is much more efficient than any other way of hand sewing. Um, and it allows you to sew three-dimensional objects instead of just flat work. So if you're, you know, if you were to try to use pinking irons to get all these holes in here with that gusset in the way, you may could do it on this front panel, but you're gonna have a little harder time as this thing builds out and becomes a, an entire item and so that's where I think there's, um, they're great and they're real good tools, but they're limiting, I think, on uh, your, your accessibility on things that you can actually sew with. Not to mention they can get expensive. And so we're able to stitch this project here with mainly just a couple needles some thread and this awl. You don't even really need the overstitch wheel if you don't want to use it. Um, you can use a pair of a pair of wing dividers or something like that to uh, mark your holes if you'd prefer. It's just slower. All right, so here we're at the end of the stitch. And so what we're gonna do is back stitch. Again, in the stitching video, I go through this in depth, but what basically you're gonna stitch backwards over your last stitches there. We're gonna do that usually two times, two to three times, and then we'll cut the stitches and that will end this run. And so it'll be tied off and proper and you can move on to the next step. Okay, so we got our gusset sewn onto one of our front panels. We'll sew that other one off camera, just kind of try to keep this video somewhat short. Um, we're just using a couple little harness needles there. Uh, we're gonna set those off to the side so we don't lose them. But we've got the um, gusset sewn on here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna take our X-Acto knife and I'm just gonna very carefully go along here and trim any little bit of excess that may be hanging off on our gusset side, okay? And if you, if you mounted it and flushed it up really, really nice, you might not have any in some spots, but there's probably gonna be some spots where it kind of squished out a little bit or something hanging out there. And so we wanna go ahead and trim that. And I like using these little razor blades because it's gonna do that. Um, you have a lot more control. You need to be careful, it is a razor blade, but it just gives you a little bit more control here where you can real, real easily cut that off and, and uh, not do too, too much at a time. You can take off just what you need. Um, but like I said, we'll get the other one sewn. It's in the stitching horse. I'll get it sewn in a minute, but I want to keep keep moving here on the project. So what we'll do next is we're going to get our back panel or our body here made up. 
we've got our flap, we've got it skived, we've got it edge dyed, our holes are punched, our holes are punched in the body here for all that stuff. We've got our lines marked on where that's gonna glue. And so basically this is gonna get sewn down to the flap will get sewn down to the body. And then once that's sewn in, then we'll be ready to mount the front panel making the rest of the pocket or the rest of the bag there. And we'll sew again all the way around that. Um, before we do that, what I wanna do is I wanna come in, remember these, these two lines on the body are three quarters of an inch wide. So I'm gonna put a mark here at say five eighths because I wanna be sure that I don't get any glue past my three quarter inch mark because when that flap bends over and comes down the front, you'll see that glue down in there. So I just wanna kind of be safe so that we don't get any glue where we shouldn't get it. So we, all we need it to do is, the, all we need the glue to do is just to hold the flap in place while we sew it. That's all it's doing. So I've put me a mark here or a line at five eighths just so we know we're not gonna get past where we need to be. And then we'll get us some glue. And like I said, it's just holding it while we sew it. So it's not that critical. We just want to get a little glue there. I seem to be spilling lots of glue over here. This new refill of glue in this can is a little thinner than it usually is. And then same thing here. I'm going to try to get this just along there. and not too close to that top line. All right, now we'll let these dry and get tacky. I'll do the other one and then we'll come back and glue those together and we'll mark where our stitch lines are gonna go on those. Okay, so while that's drying, we're gonna go ahead and make our straps um, for our buckle to, to buckle down the flap on here. And so we're gonna, I don't really have the measurement figured out from the last time I made it, it wasn't written on the pattern. So we're gonna do that right now and figure out exactly how long we need to, uh, we need to go with on our strap. I'm gonna try to pick a nice spot here in this strap. Looks to be about right there. I'm gonna cut this end off. But basically all we're gonna do with this strap is gonna be single, we'll edge it and everything. Um, and then we'll put our buckle. I'm gonna use a three quarter inch cart buckle. This is a long cart buckle. They have one that's shorter. The opening on the inside is a little bit shorter, but I get these at Weaver Leather. Uh, there's a lot of companies that sell these um, really nice profiled cart buckles. They're my favorite. You don't need a keeper. You don't need anything like that. They're solid stainless steel. They also come in brass. So for tack and things like that, they're gonna be outside. They're great, great buckles and they hold well. So I want that buckle to buckle in about right there because we're going to have a little strap that's going to come off of the flap and so we just need the buckle to break over this bottom edge here this is also going to come down there a little bit so i'm going to figure out here exactly how far because we're going to roughly i'm, I'm going to give measurements in the pattern pack but what we're going to do is we're going to roughly do it right now and this is kind of show you exactly how i go about doing this as far as figuring out the final measurement that works the best. Um, it's usually within the pattern design or within making the actual project where you figure out some of this stuff. And so I've got that there. This is gonna sew in. When we put this front piece onto here, we're gonna push that up in there. And when we sew the gusset in, we'll sew across this strap and that's gonna sew that strap in there. Then the buckle will come up here and buckle in. And so I think that's gonna be probably plenty for us to work with because this buckle is very easily gonna be put on this strap once it's already sewn in the bag. We don't necessarily have to put the buckle on right now. And so we're gonna go ahead and do that much. That'll give us enough to, to work with. And so we need two of those. And now that I know the length, that's actually a pretty good piece of leather right there. And so I'll mark it. Mark that.
piece that I'm using is about seven inches long, but I'll get a final precise measurement for the pattern pack. It'll have that in there on how long to actually cut this. Um, but that's what we're gonna do there um, for now. And then we'll, we'll trim it to where we need it. So those are for the bottom strap or the buckle strap. This piece here, all we need is probably one inch to go inside. Yep. So we need a one inch piece or one inch mark. And that's what will go inside there. We'll put a rivet right there. And so I'm gonna go ahead and guess that we need probably another, at least another seven inches or so. We'll make that work and we'll trim that to fit again once we get it on the bag. When we're fine tuning the end of it. Now I used, I used the back side of my knife right there just to make me a line on that strap. I did not use the front side. All I did was use the, the backbone of the blade, which is very dull. I just used it as a marking tool. Um, just for those that saw me do that and thought, oh, you just messed up your blade on that rock. I had it upside down. Um, it's just something I've, I've always kind of done that just here and there if I need to, if I need to make a mark right quick. Okay, so those are gonna be those. And we've got those cut, so those will be over there. We'll dress those here in just a minute because this glue is now ready. And so we'll take one of our bodies of the bag. It doesn't matter which flap you use, the flaps are the same left and right. The back piece is the only piece that actually kind of matters or has a left and a right. You're gonna line this up right along the outside edge and you're gonna bottom it out on that bottom line. Make sure it's all the way in there. All right. So now our flap is glued on. We'll glue this other one. Okay, so now if we remember correctly, our line, the two lines that we have, they're three quarters of an inch apart. So what we'll do is we'll just pull tape on the bottom of that little flap there, make a mark at three quarter. And that's where I'm gonna stitch. Here, put a line. And we don't need to stitch all the way to the edge because you're going to put this is gonna line up on that mark too, both tops of your gusset. And that's where your gusset's gonna be. So we really only need to stitch maybe say a half inch from the outside. Okay, no, so now the way I'm gonna sew it is I'm gonna sew a square. So I'm gonna come in or a rectangle I'm gonna start here or somewhere and I'm gonna go down along this edge and then I'm gonna come up and then I'm gonna go over that way. That's gonna secure this, secure this bottom flap so that it doesn't come up as you're reaching in there to grab stuff. You're not flipping that glue loose and flipping that up. It'll be securely sewed down along the bottom as well as along the top right here. That's gonna make that flap nice and secure. If you would prefer not to sew twice, basically a big rectangle, you can just sew on that top edge right there. That's gonna cover, pull that nice and tight you won't get any expansion on when this flap comes over and see down in there where the glue is. If you'll sew right there, that'll take care of that. But I think over time, this is that glue breaks loose. If it does, that's gonna end up flipping up and it's gonna be annoying when you're reaching down inside the bag. So when I sew these on a machine, I always just basically sew a big rectangle right there and that catches the bottom, catches the top. So I'm gonna get my overstitch wheel. No need to groove this. This is on the inside, it's on the rough out. I don't necessarily groove that here. And so I'm just going to run my whole space in there. And then I'll do the same going this way. And then I'm just going to ride along the edge right here. Now 
And so there's our hole space in there. And we'll sew that in place and then we'll be ready to put our front on. All right, so I've got my thread ready to go. Um, I did about a pull and a half on this. This isn't quite as long as the gusset was. So that's about what we're gonna do there. And I'm just gonna start and we're gonna sew. Start sewing. thread centered up. All right, so we got our flap sewn on, and as you can see, it's just a big, long rectangle there. Um, and that sewed up really a lot faster than the other piece did. And so now when we fold that flap down, you're not gonna see any glue or anything. It's nice and clean in there. And so that's why I like to do it that way. It just kind of makes it, makes it a lot more professional looking. Also, this flap is not gonna tear loose out of here. You don't have just one stitch line. So like I said, you can do one, you can get away with one fine, not a big issue, but I've always just done two when it comes to the flap. So now we've got to glue the front panel on there as well as our strap for our buckle. We'll have to go in there too when we, when we mount that. So we'll get that ready. But first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and sand and edge and slick this front piece because it's gonna be a little easier to do before we glue it onto the other, to the back piece. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna get our sanding blocks here and we're just gonna sand all the way around here and get a nice clean edge and then we'll edge it and slick it and then we'll let that dry and then we'll dye it, okay? And um, I'm gonna kind of build one side of the bag. We'll build the other side exactly like this. So, but I'm gonna do all that off camera, but I'll build this one side here for the rest of the deal. And then we'll bring both of them together after they're both done and we'll put them together with the frog and wrap them up. Okay, so we've got this all sanded. Just want to make sure that your gusset is nice and even everything looks good we're gonna do the easy side first which is face down right here we'll edge the back of the gusset and that's gonna be there and depending on your chap leather this might be easy to edge this might be more difficult to edge that's just part of leather selection uh, this stuff here edges pretty nicely just take your time trim that Okay, and now we're gonna edge around the top of this, or the face. And this can get a little tricky, so sometimes having a little elevated work surface right here is helpful when you have a gusset on there, because you can kind of walk that around. And I'm using my number four edger. Gonna be the proper size for this thickness. It's gonna give us a really nice rounded edge. Now we'll grab our slicking rag and slicking water. And we're just gonna go around here and slick this edge right quick. And then we'll let that dry and dye it as well. Be easier to dye right now than once it's sewn on there. All right, so there's our edges. We'll just set this aside for, for right now. We can go ahead and let those dry a little bit. We'll put some dye on those. So what we wanna do now is I'm gonna take these straps and we're gonna go ahead and edge those while we're here and get those ready to go so that we're ready to install them when we need to um, while we're letting that dry. And so I'm just gonna take a number four edger. This is pretty heavy material. And so if you're using something lighter, you could definitely use like a five, six ounce strap, um, you know, out of edge tan. You could use a piece of Latigo like this, it's lighter weight. Um, whatever you prefer to use for your buckles, the buckle and strap. But this Latigo is fairly heavy, but hopefully it won't wear out quite as fast. So I'm just gonna edge that with a number four. And 
Okay, now we're gonna have to take our safety skiver again. And on the ends, remember one's gonna get sewn in underneath the gusset right here. And the other one is gonna actually get sewn into or riveted into, we're gonna go through that bag slot and we're gonna put a rivet in there in the flap. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take some of this off. I'm gonna take two of them and select those for the gusset piece. And I'm gonna come in probably, I don't know, three quarters of an inch, maybe up to an inch. And we're gonna sky that down to a feathered edge. like that. That way when we put that inside here, we're gonna glue it in place. Well, we'll actually just put the gusset on and then we'll we'll kind of put a little glue there and then we can push it in there. But we wanna come in there into the bottom here, maybe three quarters of an inch or so, come in plenty so that we're stitching meat on this strap. I don't wanna stitch right here along this edge because that is way too thin, that'll pull out very easily. But I want what's inside the bag to be real thin and it can lay down and, and roll over and stuff. It's not gonna be in the way. I don't want it thick, but I also wanna take and I want the edges of this to just taper off just a tick. And that way, when we go to sew around here, when the gussets, when that front panel's in here in the gusset, when we sew around this, it's not gonna be a big jump right here on each side. That's a good rule of thumb, even if you're hand sewing, to get into your preparation of material properly that way so that when you do start sewing on a machine, you always want that machine. A machine can deal with multiple levels of thickness, but if you don't do it properly, you're gonna have a problem. And by properly, I mean it shouldn't go from one thickness and then just jump up to, a, to another thickness real quickly. It should really taper up to that next thick, thickness there. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, it's not as much of a problem when you're hand stitching, but it will make the final look that much cleaner and that much better. So we wanna be sure and do that. So we're gonna skive it down, you know, three quarters to an inch, down to nothing. And then we wanna just knock off the edge on each side just a little bit. But we do need meat in this strap that we're gonna be sewing to. And that way it doesn't pull out very easily. So we'll do the other one just the same way. And that's real nice. Now, if you have a problem with all this spot here and you can't seem to get it with a skiver, you just take your scissors and cut that clean. That works good too. Just to make it look a little more presentable. Not like anybody's gonna see it inside the bag. Now what we wanna do on these two bottom panels, and I'll get this other flap sewn up here in just a little while. But what we wanna do is we wanna find center down here on this bottom part because we need to go ahead and slick that because when we have the gusset on there, you're gonna have a hard time edging, slicking, and dyeing that one little spot. And so what we're gonna do is go ahead and find center here with a very light line. I'm gonna do it up here too, just real light. And now we'll take our square, line up those two marks, and that'll give us our center down here. Okay, do the same thing on this one. That's how you find center if you've got a radius. You just get somewhere where you don't have one and then square out of that. And if you do that, you can usually get pretty close. This isn't that critical, but we just need to know about where the middle is so that we can edge the area correctly. I'm gonna go ahead and make that mark a little harder. That way I know exactly where that center is and that's where that strap's gonna go. So this little strap, when we skived, we're gonna glue it in right there, right in the middle, okay? But before we do that, we'll take our edger and we're just going to edge across that and edge across that, okay? Now we can go ahead and slick that. And when that dries, you can go ahead and put a touch of dye on there. And that way you don't have to try fighting it, not getting it on your little strap and all that stuff. We can go ahead and do that now. Okay guys, so we got our edge dye on our edges here on our front panel. Now we're gonna go ahead and uh, get everything marked off so that we can line this up. 
technically by the pattern you should be lining up your gusset to the top of these stitches because that's where we put them was at three quarters of an inch from the bottom up so that the gusset should start there and start there i like to check myself a lot so when i'm working i will line this up and just make sure that that's gonna that's gonna work make sure i didn't cut it out funny or something happened so i'm gonna kind of look at it and just make sure this thing looks square looking down at it and i can see that i need to go about right there at the bottom of where my stitches are so you put the panel on there when you line it up just be sure you have it square this away you're your, your square all the way around the edge um, you've got it in there you you look level on the top and if you do that that should tell you exactly where you need to glue these tabs of this gusset when you flip it around then you, off those marks that's where you'll glue the gusset okay and so before we glue that in what we're going to do is we're going to take our strap that we skived we're going to center that up i'm going to run that line up just a little bit so i can see where my center is and i want to be sure that i'm stitching through meat on this strap again like I said, don't stitch this real close where it's super thin down here because that's gonna pull out and then that's gonna be a booger to try to repair. You're gonna have to unstitch it and, and pull that out and put a new one in. So I wanna be back here in this meat of the strap where I've still got some thickness in there. It's not super thin. That's three quarters of an inch width. So we should end up with probably three stitches across there, maybe four. That's gonna be plenty to hold this little strap in there with this buckle hanging off of it. The buckle's gonna mount on this strap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to line that up, get it centered, and get about where I think I'm going to have some good stitches in place. Make sure it's level. And then I'm going to run a line across there. And that's going to tell me where I need to line it up to the bottom of this. So then we can take some glue. And you can mark this on the back side if you want. I'm just going to eyeball it because I can kind of see where my mark is. You're going to put just a little bit of glue just right there. That's going to just hold it in place. The gusset's going to be in there too, so that's going to help. But that don't go too far this way because we don't want the glue showing on the back side. So we'll set that off to the side and let that dry. And then what we're going to do is take this. We're going to go all the way around the edge just like we did on the front panel. For our gusset and we'll put a coat of glue set that off to the side and let that dry now we'll take our panel and we're going to glue all the way around inside here We'll let that dry now i'm also going to put a little bit of glue on this side of the strap because that's where the gusset's going to be glued to this side's starting to dry a little bit we'll add just a little touch of a second coat let that hang off the uh, edge of the workbench there so they can get air on both sides and we'll just let all that kick and then we'll be ready to glue the gusset in as well as our strap all right so our glue is tacky i did do two coats just like we did when we put the first gusset in um, and now we've got some good tackiness there, so it's ready to go. First thing we're gonna do is glue in our strap. So we'll come down right here. I've got marks on the top. You want the rough out facing up. That way the slick side of the strap is what shows because the strap is gonna do this basically across the front of the bag. So our buckle will mount there on that. And so we want the rough out facing up. And so we'll just line this up, center it on that line that we made. And we'll just set that in there. Give it a little tap right there so it stays. And now we're ready to glue this. Now, just like when we do other gussets, here we have a couple of marks. We feel pretty confident that those are right. But as we work through, we're gonna thumb it down and get it get it stuck in place, get it, get the corners nice and everything. But if we have if we get it on there and then we look at it and it looks askew and it's not square with this back panel, then we might have to take it off and reset it. So just keep that in mind. Um, so it's all about being square here. And so we're gonna start at our little mark that we had, stay flush with the outside. 
of our body. Work our way around till we start coming down into the corner. I'm gonna pull that around, I'm gonna glue that. Now I'm gonna come over here and start here. Line up on my mark there on my bag that I made. This gets a little trickier as you get into these corners. You'll have to kind of reach in and kind of pull that leather out a little bit. And you want it fairly flush with your edge. Make sure your little strap is staying where it's supposed to be. Now I'm gonna look at the bag from here and kind of pull my flap down. Make sure that that front panel looks pretty square. It's a round bottom, so it's not like on our briefcases or our purses where uh, even the rope bag to where it's a flat bottom and if they're askew, it's not gonna stand up. These are meant to hang, not to stand, but you still wanna make sure that it's square with the back panel that it's attached to. And that looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna scoot this top panel over just enough where I can get in here with my shop mallet. Get some good contact where we're gluing that together. Now what I want to do is, we're not going to groove this obviously, and I'm not going to groove the back side because it's the back side. So we're not going to be able to groove the, the chap leather because it doesn't groove very, very well at all usually. So what I'm going to do is take our wing dividers, I'm going to set my stitch relief to just about what we have on our front stitches here. And now I can just come in here, scribe me a line being careful to stay on my material. And I can scribe me a line all the way around there. And that's gonna tell me where my stitches are gonna be. Then we can take our overstitch wheel and just ride down that line. Try to stay on our line best we can. That'll mark all of our holes for our stitch length, as you can see there. So we'll go all the way around here. All right. And as you can see, we got plenty of strap here to work with. So we may cut off that much when we go ahead and mount this buckle, but we'll deal with that later. And now we're ready to sew this gusset on and this one side of the bag will almost be done. All right, so we've got our bag here in our jaws. Now this is an advantage to having a stitching horse um, with, with jaws like this is you can get inside places, you know, as you're building and constructing a project, you might not be able to get the positioning just how you want it, but you can get pretty close. And I like to keep my jaws as close to possible as to where I'm stitching, but this is about as close as we're gonna get. When we get down to the bottom here, I should be able to shove this bag further down in the jaws because these jaws are fairly tall. And then I can, you know, reposition and be sewing all the way around. So this should be the set going forward as we sew this thing up. So we'll do it the same way we did the other one, the only thing difference here is that my first stitch, I'm going to start right off of the bag or right off of the gusset because I want that top edge of that gusset to not flip. So I'm actually just going through the flap and the, the, the flap and the body. I'm not catching the gusset just yet, but I'm right up against the gusset. 
And that's gonna be my very first stitch. We'll center up our thread. Now my next stitch will be the first one that we marked. And so you can see how that stitches down this top edge of this gusset, so it's less apt to, to pull loose. All right, so we've gotten our gusset sewn in here. We've already got our strap. We sewed straight across our strap. You wanna to try to get at least three stitches um, in there, three to four stitches in that strap. And then that strap will just come around and we're gonna mount our buckle. But basically this side of the bag is pretty well done. We've got our flap sewn in, our gusset. So we'll go ahead and get our buckle mounted onto this strap. And like I said, we're gonna use the cart buckle. You can use whatever buckle you prefer on this deal. Um, we're gonna go ahead and come in here about five inches off from the bottom of that. Um, in the pattern pack, I've already done the measuring, so it'll tell you how long to cut this strap. I think it's five and three quarter inches long, and you got about three quarters of an inch or so that goes inside that gusset area there. And so we're gonna go ahead and you just cut this off. And then we need to Cut a tip on here. You don't have to do this, but I think it looks nicer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and come in here. Now they make an end punch that's either an English point, a square point, a round point, whatever you wanna do. Those aren't in this tool kit, so we're gonna cut it by hand. Um, you can kind of cut it whatever shape you want. You can just round this off, whatever you wanna do there. I'm just gonna come in here and just kind of round that off like a kind of a muted English point. And that's just so that it looks nice underneath there where we roll that around. And then I'm just gonna take my X-Acto knife. You can use any knife you prefer. And I'm just gonna cut on my line. And then you can take your little sanding block and you can shape that up some. And then I like to take my edger and just knock a little bit of that off there. I'm not gonna worry about the backside because we're about to skive that a little bit. And so what we'll do is we'll take our skiver. I want this to fold around that buckle fairly easily and that's for pretty thick. So you can kind of use your judgment on whatever leather that you decide to use. You might not need to take any off. If you use a little lighter weight. Our blade's getting a little dull in our skiver, so, but that's gonna fold over nicely. And so what I wanna do is, about an inch from the end is where I want the center of my bag slot, my oblong slot for the buckle tongue. So this buckle has a tongue in it, all buckles do, so we wanna be sure that we do that. So what we're gonna do is, gonna get our number four drive punch I'm just gonna set a hole just like we did on the other bag slots. We'll go a little ways on each side of our mark. And then we'll make our cuts in there. This is gonna cut a little easier because it's latigo. So I'm just gonna lift up on that, go to the next hole. We'll get this scored a little bit. And there we have a bag slot there. So now this buckle can go in there. And we can set a rivet. And I'm actually gonna make that back slot just a hair longer. It's just a little short. I just kind of eyeballed that. So we're gonna make it just a little bit longer. So we've made that just a little bit longer there. Now we'll see how our buckle fits. There we go. As you can see, that's gonna fold over and the 
all this bulk is on top of here. It's not catching on this bottom piece of that of that front panel. Now to mark our holes for this, you could definitely get this off to the side and hold it and try to drive punch through both of those at one time, but it's not gonna be quite as easy as if you had a squeeze punch, which is what I usually use, but we don't have one of those in this kit. This tool set, so we're gonna do it all with drive punches. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my stitching awl and I'm gonna make a mark right there. So I'm gonna go right there about where I want that rivet. And I'm gonna go all the way through. Watch your fingers, don't run it into your finger. But I'm going all the way through both of those. And that will mark where we need our hole for our rivet. So now we can come right there. And we've got a hole on this side. Just two holes. Now we can set our rivet. Now we've got some copper rivets here. These are just number nine copper rivets. My favorite rivet to use. And we'll use our rivet setter. We're gonna need a little anvil. Like I said, any scrap piece of steel will work for this. Take our anvil, put our buckle on. I always like the rivet pointing down so that you don't see the burr, okay? Only Exception to that is if you're doing tack some sort, I usually face the rivets out so that the burr side is not facing the horse. But it's not, you see that not done a lot and I guess it's not that critical, but I prefer it to be facing out if at all possible and it's aesthetically acceptable. Um, it's not always, sometimes you do have to face the horse, but if you do, you're gonna be sure that you Peen those rivets down very nicely. There's no sharp edges there that can scratch or cut him. These rivets are a little long because I buy one inch rivets because I do a lot of heavier work and I need the length on those. So I have to clip a little bit off and then drive this the rest of the way down. That burr nice and snug. And now we'll clip off the excess. And I like to leave, oh, that's probably an eighth of an inch maybe, maybe not even that much, just enough there to where now we can take the peening side of our rivet setter, give it a good lick there, and then spin it and tap on it. I like to just kind of walk it side to side, and that will kind of mushroom out that burr side. Now we'll take our ball peen hammer, just our nice little ball peen hammer, and just really lightly shape up that burr side. I see a lot of guys really beat this really hard. And what happens is if you pound that really, really hard with a ball peen hammer, you're not doing yourself any favors. And what'll happen is you're uh, on thicker leather. It can even do it on this one. You'll end up coning or depressing the burr. And so it's kind of cupped like a little saucer or a little bowl. That's really not proper. You want that burr as flat to remain as flat as possible because if you start cupping that inward towards the leather, just in my mind, that's more apt to pull through the leather because you've started kind of a, a downward force or a downward uh, shape into that leather. And so over time, I think it's gonna pull out a little easier. So I try not to do that. It just kind of, all you're doing is lightly shaping the burr side and so it looks nice, it's nice and smooth. You don't have anything to catch or scratch anything that it, that it comes up in contact with. So we've got our buckle on there and now we'll put our strap on this side. Same thing on the strap. This one for the down strap, I figured out uh, about six inches is perfect. So you do them both six inches if you want, it's not that critical, but I just kind of figured out six inches is about right. And so we'll cut that off at six. And then we'll do the same here. Do whatever kind of end point shape you want. I'm gonna go use my bigger edger because this end's not gonna be skived down at all. So there's our point in. This end here, I'm going to 
just kind of cut the corners off just a little bit just so it's a little more pleasing to look at it's going to be on the inside but it'll look a little more professional sand that up a little bit okay so i've taken the old blade out i like to use an awl so you can use the awl that's in the in a kit any big awl and flip that out but don't flip it and throw it because a lot of times when they come out of here they'll go flying so what i like to do is just wing that push on the end of it and just wing it out enough to where you can grab it with your fingers and pull it out and throw it in the trash or what i like to do is keep a little tin can coffee can something like that throw them in there the old ones and then when that can gets full you can put the lid on that duct tape that shut throw that in the garbage and it just i don't it's from working in labs and, and things in, in college and, and uh, like I said, I was trying to go to vet school. So I've had a lot of times in, in uh, vet labs and worked for a bunch of veterinarians and stuff, but also you have sharps containers just like at the hospital. And I just have, it's out of habit. I don't like throwing razor blades like this in a trash can because whoever, if somebody needs to dig through the trash can for whatever reason, they lose a part or something, or even at the landfill and stuff, people walking around. Um, you know, I've seen accidents happen with, with needles and different things that are sharp, broken glass and things inside a regular trash bag. So um, I like to put them in a can where you can put a lid on that, duct tape it shut, throw it away when it gets full. Anywho, sidetracked on that. But um, then you're gonna take your new blade and start down here, st begin to push it into, hope you can see that. So we'll start here and take the blade. I start pushing it down here at this end till it gets close. Make sure that the front end stays as deep into that little catch area as possible so that it doesn't flip out on you. Sometimes when you're putting them in too, they'll flip out and, and go flying. Um, and then once you get close here, take your awl and just push that end in. Try not to touch your blade area because you're going to dull it, but then push that in. Now that's in and secure. It's all the way in the blade or in the handle. And so that's how you replace those. Um, and now we're just going to take this and I'm going to skive down just a little bit off this end Just so that it's not Quite as bulky when we put it inside the flap bag slot So I'm not taking it down to a feather because we need meat to hold when we put that rivet in there, but it, I'm taking it down some and so this end will go in there and i'm going to go in to that bag slot roughly three quarters to one inch somewhere around there um, you can kind of adjust that as you want it's not that critical but you want it far enough in there that when we punch this hole we've got enough meat past it to where our rivets biting onto good material and so we'll put that in there and then we'll mark where our rivet hole is going to go so that's where our rivet hole is going to go. Now, before I get this in there, it's a good time to go ahead and punch our holes on this strap. So you can kind of do whatever dimensions you want to do. I'm going to come up one inch from the bottom and put a mark, and I'm going to space these out three quarters of an inch each. So we're going to go from one inch to one and three quarter to two and a half to two and a quarter to four. And I'm going to put holes all right there. And I'm going to use my number four hole punch. It's a good size for this particular buckle. If you're using a buckle with a smaller tongue, you can use a number two. But on a three-quarter inch strap, number four is a good, a good size for buckle holes. All right, so when I decide what uh, size hole that I'm gonna use for any kind of strap or anything, the two factors really, one is the tongue, how big the tongue is. It's gotta be able to fit through that hole comfortably, but you don't want a whole lot of slack in there. Um, also, the, the width of the strap that we're using, you wanna make sure that you've got enough meat on each side of the hole. Um, if we were to put a big number eight there for some buckle with a big old fat tongue or something on there, um, you're not gonna have very much meat on each side and that's gonna tear easier. So that's a good, good, uh, size right there so that's why i use a number four on majority of my head stalls and things like that um so that's why we put it in the tool list um and then again like i said number four for our rivet so we've got our mark for our rivet punch that hole and so now 
all we've got to do is rivet this on. Now you could definitely rivet this onto your flat before you sew it into the bag. It'd probably make it easier and all that stuff. I usually just, I usually just tend to kind of put it on at the end, but you could definitely put it on before you even sew the flap into the bag. Might be a lot easier. Um, then we'll put that on there. We'll get our anvil again and come here. This is kind of where you gotta kind of manhandle this bag a little bit. Get a rivet setter. Again, this is a little long for this project. You can buy rivets in three quarter inch length. I think they even sell half inch or five eighths inch rivets. Um, buy the longest length that you think you'll use ma the majority of the time. Like I said, a lot of my saddle stuff, I need that one inch rivet for the length of them. So when I end up doing projects like this, the rivets are a little too long for what I'm working on. And there's our burr, and then we'll take our, again, we're just gonna lightly round that out, make it nice. Again, we're not just whooping the heck out of it and smashing it all up. All right. So there's our buckle. Got a nice rivet there. Got our buckle here. And so as you can see, if this bag's not got anything in it, you can really suck this down. And you can also go out if you as you fill the bag up. One, one real quick note on rivets that I wanted to mention. When you go to buy these, and we'll do a video on supplies, like starting out supplies, what fasteners do you need to get in a first kit as beginner, things like that, and, uh, threads and finishes. But on rivets, I'll talk about them here a little bit. Um, the reason I say buy the length that you're gonna use for the majority of your projects, like don't buy one inch if you're always wasting a bunch of them, a bunch of the end, because all your projects are thinner, like this project, um, because rivets are sold by the pound. So the shorter the rivet you buy, the more rivets you get per pound. The one inch, I'm not getting as many as if I was buying a 5 8 rivet. Um, so you wanna kind of, kind of stay as long as you need them, but not any longer than you need them. That way you're not wasting quite as much. Um, so that's something to think about just on how you're buying them. But that's one side of the bag, it's completed. Um, outside of, I forgot, we've got to go ahead and do something with our edges real quick now that we've got all that done. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through here and I'm going to trim to just save on the amount of sanding that I have to do. I'm gonna trim anything that's overhanging the, the chap leather here, and then I'll turn it over to and make sure my chap leather's not overhanging on this side. And that's just gonna square that up so that we've got a nice edge to sand and bevel and uh, slick. Be very careful so that you don't get in there too deep. Now we'll just take our sanding block. We're gonna sand all the way around here. Be careful, we've already slicked an edge right here, so we don't have to worry about that. But don't scratch your strap there with your, with your sanding block. But we'll sand this, edge it, and slick it. We'll take our number four edger here and edge both sides. Now when you're slicking edges, one thing that does help is a, uh, using your rub stick. And you can come through here and just get your edges started. You can also kind of finalize your edges with a rub stick. I don't always use it when I'm doing edges. It really depends on the project and the materials I'm using. But that does help to get it started. You take your slicking rag and work that. All 
All right, now you're gonna find that you've got a little spot right there in that chap leather. Sometimes it doesn't, the chap leather doesn't slick up super good anyway, but I like to put just a little bit of water right there and do my best to get it kind of finished right there. So just so it's not nappy looking, because that, that one little spot will jump out if everything else is at least kind of slicked down. Like I said, some chap leathers just don't slick very, very well, but we're gonna do it anyway. And that way it looks nice. All right. So this side of the bag is now done. We'll buckle that shut. And that bag is completed. So we've got one side. Now we'll basically do all of those steps to get the other side done. And then we'll come back. I'll get the other set of bags put together hand sewn and everything, you're gonna repeat the exact same process that we've already done. Um, like I said, on the second bag, if you'd rather mount your buckle strap to the flat before you sew it on, you can definitely do that. I might do that just so it's a little easier, um, but we'll do that and then we'll come back when we've got two bags and we will sew this frog in here and that will complete the bags. That's really all you'll have left. So fairly straightforward, build two of these, sew them together, you've got one set of bags and we'll come back when I get that other bag done. Okay guys, so we've gotten the bags put together. Um, I got the other one done off camera. Both of them are now ready to go. So basically you end up, you'll end up with two independent bags. All that's left to do is to cut our little uh, lace leather for in here, which we'll do that uh, at the end, and to sew these together. And once we do that, we'll have a completed set of saddle bags and then we'll oil them and finish them. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so all you should have left now would just be your frog. And on the pattern, when we trace these out, we went ahead, I'll just move one of these out of the way here. Um, we went ahead and made a little tracing of where this frog needs to sit so that it's centered on to the bag. So I have my line already on here and I uh, probably can't see it real good in the video, but you can trace that off, off the pattern so that you know where you're gonna put your glue and we'll glue this in place. But what I wanna do is is I'm going to set this on here real quick because I want to groove this so it looks really nice. And so I'm going to line this up on one saddle bag and I'm going to put a line just a little bit inside the edge of this bag on my frog. That's going to be where I need those stitches to stop and then turn and go across. Um, because this, if this is on here, the way I have it designed is that I have a little bit of a overhang so it hangs over the edge of the bag so we don't want to sew all the way around here we want to sew up to here and then across to join both bags together as we sew them in but i'm going to put a mark right there and then i'm going to do the same on the other side but i'm just going to measure this time because they should be the same so i'm about three and a half inches from the very end to where my mark is so then i'll come over here and put a mark at three and a half so that means we're going to go ahead and stitch across and we should catch we should catch the front of those bags. So we use our straight edge and I'll draw me a little line. Oop. Make sure you get it straight. Okay. And now we'll groove. We're going to groove the same distance that we did on the front panel. So if your groove is still set from the last time you used it, we'll groove that. Up to our line. And there. Now this one's gonna be a little tricky to get with this one, but we'll see if we can do it. Sometimes you can freehand a little bit with this groover. We just follow our line. And there's our, our little groove there. Um, that's where the wing divider style of Groover, the horseshoe brand one that Jeremiah Watt makes, that's where that, that one comes in a little more handy because you can just wing it out and really stay on your line. And so now we'll take our overstitch wheel again and we're gonna start in a corner and we're gonna mark all of our stitch holes. And you wanna try to land in the corner, if you can see there, I'm just a little bit of ways from that corner. So I'm gonna go ahead and start roughly at that corner, but a little bit away from my last mark.
And so now we'll just take the over stitch wheel all the way around, make our marks. Now we'll get our bags over here and kind of get them lined up. Be sure you can see where that's supposed to go. And we'll put glue on the bags as well as on the frog. Now be sure and not go past where the bags actually are on the tip of that frog there, just so you don't get glue where you don't need it. And then we'll glue them together and uh, hammer them in just a little bit and we'll be ready to sew those up. Be sure that whenever you line these up that they are actually lining up flush underneath that frog so that they're flush and straight where they need to be. Okay, so we're going to start sewing these in place. Now you've got two bags kind of attached to each other so this can be a little bit more cumbersome. You may decide to not even use the stitching horse. But we're just going to get this stitches, these stitches started and go ahead and sew all the way around just like we did on everything else. Okay guys, so we've gotten our frog sewn on. Um, you're just sewing around here. I do like to go ahead and come across here when I sew that frog. Now if you want to, when you if you get the pattern pack and you make it like this and you'd prefer to just cut this little tab off, you certainly can. It would work just fine. I just think that little tab right there tucking up underneath that cannel will help those bags just to try to stay, stay centered there on the saddle. And so now that's pretty well done. All we've got to do now is trim this back end here a little bit. And so we're just gonna take our little razor knife and or you can use any knife you've got, any knife you prefer. And I'm just gonna trim some of that off. Anything that's overhanging, it's less that we gotta sand. And then what we'll do is we'll take our sanding block again and we'll go ahead and sand that. And we wanna get a nice clean edge right there. Don't worry too much if you get some of the area you've already dyed. You know, try not to mess that up too much, but if you get on it a little bit, that's okay. We're gonna re-slick this entire little back section, just this part right here, so you can touch that up. And that looks pretty good right there. So that now that is all flush. We want that nice and flush. Now we'll take our number four edger and we're just gonna edge down the back of that frog. Get that nice and clean and edged. And then we'll flip it over and get the back side. Okay. And so now we can go ahead and take our slicking stuff here a little water and soap and get this slicked up and then we'll let this edge dry and once it's dry we'll put dye on it and we'll be ready to wrap these bags up and put some oil on them Okay, so we've given the edge a, a little time to dry and I've gone ahead and put some dye on that. So that just finishes that backside out. Now that all looks dyed and nice and slick. And so now all we really lack on these bags is to put some oil on them to finish out the color that we want on them. Um, if they're going to match a saddle or if you just want them a little darker or whatever you want to do, you can add the amount of oil you want. If you don't want to add any oil, you can absolutely just go on there with uh, like a leather conditioner, Skidmore's leather cream, Duff's leather cream, whatever you want to use. That would be fine as well. I traditionally will at least put some oil on them and then go on with tan coat after that as my sealer. That's going to seal these bags up and make them look nice and finished. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And the oil that I use almost in all my projects on everything that I build is just olive oil, but you can certainly use Neatsfoot oil um, or peanut oil, anything like that. 
Um, I prefer olive oil, so that's what we're gonna use here. And I'm going ahead and doing it over here on this bench. I've got a light out back there at my oiling station, so we're gonna do it here. If you're gonna do it on a workbench that you're working on, be sure and put something down. I got a piece of cardboard right here. It's just gonna help you. You think you'll clean this table off and get all the oil picked up, but you'll inevitably put a new project on here, get some oil on something that you didn't want oil on yet. So I like to put a piece of cardboard down anytime I'm doing any kind of finish work um, or paper, whatever you wanna use. And I'm just gonna put a light coat on these, nice even coat, and, um, and just to give them some color because I don't want them quite this light for these particular bags. I'll go ahead and oil my Latigo straps as well. Not gonna hurt that at all. Now you can see the color difference there that we've got going. Now, oh, I've got videos on oiling things and kind of how to finish products and things like that, but just if this is your first time watching one of my videos, you put this oil on here, try to get it on as even as you can. I'm just using a piece of scrap sheepskin as my applicator. You can definitely use a sponge or a rag. Um, and then you're gonna wanna let this set for probably an hour or so. Let that oil even out through the project. Make sure that it's all even. If you've got some light spots, you can go in and darken it up in just that area with some more oil. If you want the whole bag darker, you can go on it again with another coat. You can do as many coats as you want. At some point, the leather's gonna oversaturate. So just be mindful of that. You can add too much oil where it just won't ever dry. But we're gonna go ahead and do this first coat and then we're gonna let it dry for a while and call it good probably. As long as it looks even, we'll tan coat it and then we'll make our little strings that go on the inside of the bag. One quick note that I wanna make a comment about here is I do not usually oil the gussets. So if you're using oil, if you're using conditioner, Skidmore's tan coat, any of that kind of stuff, um, as far as putting that on there, you can definitely hit the, the gusset, but with oil, I usually don't because it's gonna darken that quite a bit and it's already usually an oil tan or some type of oil tan. And so it doesn't need to have any oil on it um, and it will darken it quite a bit. So I try to keep, I try to keep my oil off of my gusset best I can. And I'm not going to oil on these. I'm not going to oil the backside. If you want to, you certainly can. Um, on these, I'm just going to leave them. I'm not going to oil the inside of the bag or anything like that. I'm just doing what's exposed on the outside here. And we're going to call that good. Um, usually on saddles and things, the backside of the leather, I would go ahead and oil as well. But on this bag here, I'm just going to do the what's exposed and what's seen because I'm just strictly doing this mainly for color on these. I'm not expecting these bags to to necessarily be out in the rain day after day. They're more for uh, this video and for our shop. So, but that's a good little coat of oil. Oil your straps. We're gonna go ahead and let this sit, let it soak in and even up, and we'll be back to wrap up these bags. All right guys, so we've given this oil time to uh, soak in a little bit. I've got some tan coat right here, and that's all I'm putting on as the finish. Um, I like to use the tan coat, especially on products like this, because you can oil through it over time. And so it's not a uh, it's not a permanent sealer like a lacquer or a neat lacquer or something like that, a resoline. Uh, but you can certainly use the finish of your choice to just give these bags a little finished look. And I've already done this side over here. And so we're just going through. I like to get my edges all the way around the bag. Um, anything that I kind of finish, I like doing the edges. It makes them shine a little bit. Gives them that little finished look. So before we buckle these up, I've got a couple pieces of lace here. This is just 3 8 inch Latigo lace leather. Um, you want it fairly thin so that it's pliable enough to tie and run through these holes that we put. Remember we punched um, some holes inside the bag here. And so you're gonna wanna insert these, these lace pieces into those. That's gonna be for them to tie the bottoms of these bags when they put them on their saddle, tie them down to usually the rear D-ring um, of the rigging. And that's just gonna keep them from flopping up and down when they're using the bag. And these can be a little tricky to get in there, but you can get it in there. Just uh, take your time and You 
You can certainly put these in as you're putting the bags together and sewing the gussets in. I prefer not to because inevitably you will probably sew these. These will get caught in your seam or something. You'll sew through them or something like that. So I just prefer to put them in at the end. It's easy enough. And as you can see, I just ran one end through one hole, one end through the other, get them roughly even. And that's enough there to tie that bag in place on the saddle. And now we've got those in, we can buckle these closed. All right, so that's our saddlebags. They are completely done, they're ready to go. Um, again, this hole here um, it is mainly, if they have strings right there at that ear at the base of the candle where their saddle seat is, then they can run that string through this hole. Like I said, in the video, I used a number 10. I would probably go 12 to 14 uh, number size hole. Make the hole whatever you wanna make it, uh, but just big enough for a saddle string to go through there. That's usually all you need. Also, a really nice grommet would work there well. Um, too, if you've got those larger grommets, um, or you can leave them off or put a buckle there even. You can do a lot of different things as far as for the attachment of these bags onto a saddle, but they're pretty simple. As you can see, I know this video is a little longer than usual, um, just because we went through a lot of the basics. I used all the basic hand tools out of the essential tool list that we did for the uh, one of our, our uh, later videos, video we did recently. And so we only use those tools. We hand stitch the entire bag. You do have a lot more time when you're doing that and when you're using that kind of stuff, but I wanted to show you that you're able to build a project with just those tools. You don't need fancy machinery and things like that. It just makes things easier as you progress and as you go along. But you can absolutely, with a minimal amount of tools, build a project like this or any other similar project, wallets, belts, purses, gun cases, uh, slings, anything like that, you can definitely build with just those tools. Um, again, we have a pattern pack for this. If you would uh, like to purchase that, it is on our, available on our website. It does come with a lot of different tooling patterns as far as floral carving patterns. So if you wanna do a pair of these uh, with some floral carving on it, special for somebody as a gift, or maybe a customer or something like that, you can certainly pick that up at dgsaddlery.com. Just go into our store and be sure, and it is a large format print. So if you do purchase that pattern, be sure that you get the printed version if you're in the United States. We'll mail that out to you and it, it'll be the right size. You won't have to worry about it. If you get the digital version, you will have to take that to a print shop and have them uh, print that out for you because it is really large. But I appreciate you guys watching the video and be sure and go to dgsaddlery.com, sign up for the Leathercraft newsletter, and we will see you guys in the next project video.